Tonight we're taking a look at White Star Galaxy Edition, an OSR sci-fi RPG. Before we get started, I have to thank James Spawn for sending us a review copy after reading our review of the original non-Galaxy Edition of White Star. So White Star, uh, the full name being White Star White Box Science Fiction Role-Playing, was designed, written, and published by James Spawn uh, under his company Barrel Rider Games back in 2015. The Galaxy Edition, original Galaxy Edition, we're reviewing tonight, came out a couple years later, was also published by Barrel Rider. That was in 2017. Now, White Star is an OSR or old school revival, old school renaissance, whatever you want to term it, uh, role playing game based on the White Box RPG, uh, the Swords and Wizardry White Box RPG specifically. Now, White Box Fantastic Medieval Adventure Game is itself an OSR retro clone of Dungeons and Dragons specifically original Dungeons and Dragons, like the, the box that was built in Gygax's basement where him and Arneson used to produce them themselves and they came in a white box. That's why it was called White Box D&D. To be honest, I know nothing about White Box D&D except it's older than anything I own or have read myself. But that is the basic mechanical system that this is, uh, what, that White Star is based on. Now, the goal of White Star was to create a rules light rulings over rules, generic sci-fi RPG that could be used to create many of the popular sci-fi genres, tropes, and licenses to be able to play those with the rules light system. All the contents of the book are completely compatible with the original White Star and everything published for it, as well as everything published for White Box. And you can even steal monsters and adventures from one and the other. And technically, I'm pretty sure this is compatible with OD&D as well. I think by stealing, they mean sharing, creative yes. collaboration even. <laughs> yes, I shouldn't be saying you don't steal it. Uh, it the, uh, the white box doesn't lose anything if you steal it and put it in White Star or the other way around. Now, physically, White Star Galaxy Edition is a digest-sized hardcover book that's very well made and bound. Uh, this doesn't seem like the kind of book that's going to fall apart or anything. Like, it's not one of those ones that's going to sit on my shelf and the binding is going to go, if it goes, at, if ever. Um, it's 332 pages long, uh, a little bit more with some blank space at the end or whatever. Uh, it includes things like the credits and the character sheets, though. This book features an excellent and detailed table of contents, but sadly, no index. Uh, to me, that's a big omission. Um it makes the book rather hard to reference at the table, which I also found even while doing this review, when I decided to look up the name of a couple things, having to find it in the book was not easy. So indeed, though I've had some books recently where the index they did add made me wish they hadn't bothered as you would use it and waste time before remembering it was garbage. <laughs> Go with sticky note tabs instead. Yes, fair enough. Not in mine so far. Now inside the book, you will find a black and white book, which is a little strange to see nowadays. Uh, text and artwork all in black and white. It uses a single column layout with significant white space that makes it easy to read. Uh, in addition, there are callouts uh, that are reverse text that have optional rules that are well positioned so they don't break the flow. Like they're always like in a bottom after a paragraph or up at the top before you start reading. So it's not one of those ones where you're reading and all of a sudden you read, uh, you know, the little call outs there and you end up reading that and then going back and figure out where you are. So I, I was really appreciated the layout in this book. Now the artwork is a mix of styles. Um, some better than others, I would say. They, James went with 10 different independent game artists on this one. So there, there's quite the variety and breadth of artwork in here. You can find the full list of names on the written version of this review on the blog. Overall, the writing is good. Um, despite being a second edition, there were a few spelling and grammar errors to be found. Um, some sections do get rather repetitive uh, when especially get into the rules for Starship vehicles and Mecca, which are all very similar with just some minor changes. And it was obvious that I don't know which section James wrote first, but he just copy pasted it for the other three um, and then changed a few words and he did miss a couple. Uh, his, his find it replaced didn't quite work. Uh, what I didn't see, and this is important, is there wasn't anything that impacted the actual gameplay. Like any error I saw, it was obvious what I should have been reading and what was intended by the rule. Sadly, I'm finding typos in third and later editions of RPGs. Yeah. Uh, I think all we can really hope for is that when they do inevitably pop up, because mistakes happen, uh, they mm. don't impact the mechanics. And that's the real key. 
Yeah, and that's the case here. I didn't find anything that ruined anything here. Now, what I think I'll do next is I'm going to give you a quick chapter by chapter breakdown of what you'll find in White Star Galaxy Edition. So the game starts off, the book starts off with an introduction and moves into character creation, but not before pointing out something important. And that's the style of play this game is meant to emulate. Now, a big part of the OSR movement is a DIY, a do-it-yourself element. Players are encouraged to make this game their own. And all of the rules in the book are meant as suggestions or guidelines. If there's a rule you don't like, toss it or modify it. Throughout the rules, you actually see this at work with callouts from the designer suggesting optional rules. So stuff that James thinks makes the game better, or at least will appear to appeal to different audiences. Like this isn't like a modern D20 RPG, like the world's most popular game that's designed for tournament play, where every table on the world over is expected to be playing by the same rules so everyone gets a similar experience. This, like the original Dungeons and Dragons white box it's based on, is all about providing a toolkit, not a hard and fast set of rules. More role play, less rule play. And that's R-O-L-E play and not R-O-L-L play. <laughs> So your attributes in White Star are strength, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, or sorry, constitution, not charisma, dexterity. No, oh, yes, I'm just saying them in the wrong order. They didn't put them in the D&D order. And to me, it's always strength, dex, con, it, whiz, charisma. For some reason, I don't know if it's a legal thing, James lists them strength, intelligent, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, and charisma. So sorry, I messed that up. Just because in my head, they go in a certain order, and that's just trained in my head for playing D&D for many years. Uh, these are all stats you're going to recognize, obviously, and as expected from an old school role playing game, you roll your stats 3d6, no rerolls in order, top to bottom. Though the game does, of course, as I mentioned, have a call out with optional rules for using other methods like heroic characters and so on. Now, each stat does something to modify the mechanics of the game, including the very old school idea that a stat in the specialty of a class, every every stat. Every class has a specialty stat. And if the number's high enough, I think it's over 16, you get a bonus for XP. Like I haven't seen this mechanic in a long time. I personally think that's for good reason. I never understood the, just because you're good, you get even better. I never understood that in a role-playing game. Other than the XP bonus, stats do do other things we've seen before. Now this isn't the huge list of things strength does say in, in a, a modern D&D game, but like strength gives you your bonus to hit, bonus to damage. Constitution gives you extra hit points. Charisma sets your base loyalty and sets your max number of assistants, which is this system's form of hirelings. Uh, intelligence gives alien mystics their ability to use gifts. Wisdom lets other classes use meditations and so on. It's, it's the kind of thing we've seen for years now. Now, attribute bonuses here only go from minus two to plus two. So you don't have any of those 18s of plus five and three is a minus five. You don't have that big range that you have in the popular systems. It's a much smaller modifier to your actual die rolls. And, and less swingy isn't really a bad thing as far as I'm concerned. Right. But XP, because you have a better natural ability, just not kosher. Yeah, it's, at <laughs> least it's not based on race. So they, they didn't, they did not, they completely avoided race, which actually is an od and d thing. You though, yep. the, there are no, like in that, there were races because you played an elf and uh, your race was a class, but they didn't even go that way at all, right. which I thought was good to see. So at least you don't get modifiers based on what race you are. So James did avoid that landmine and in, in a, in a, a progressive move there. Um, another landmine he dodged is, uh, Alignment's completely optional. And I think the only reason it's in here is because you want to be able to play Star Wars with the light side and the dark side. And what the alignments are in this is star, nebula, and void, with star being the bright goodness and void being the darkness and nebula being someone in the middle. Yeah, I'm really surprised when I see alignment in games anymore. It's such yeah. a dated concept. But of course, this game is riding the dated concept wave. So not yeah. surprising. <laughs> and again, I think it's actually required to emulate specifically star wars star wars has a built-in alignment system thankfully it's not a morality system as much it's much more abstract now character who get some starting credits here and optionally you have the option to use serials now this is something i really like it's fairly modern 
Serials is a system to give the character some background, and it involves rolling on some charts to determine things like your home world type, your family background, uh, events that happened in your youth, the first adventure you went on. It establishes adversaries before you start play, allies the characters made, and showcases one critical event in their path. And I dig this because the whole idea of serials is so integral to classic sci-fi, right? Your Buck Rogers, your Flash Gordons. Each of these roles not only gives you story prompts, but also gives the character some kind of mechanical bonus. And they are all bonuses. For example, the character's home planet was destroyed. You get plus two to saving throws against fear because you've already lived through the worst thing that could happen. So still not as fun as a traveler RPG generation or character generation, I assume. No, not at all. This is a very this is a this is a D and D style character generation. Roll your stats, write down your modifiers, pick a character class. That's going to give you some basic abilities, and then you're going to go shopping. That's it. There are no life paths here. This is this is just a bunch of random charts to give you some cool background, which is nice, but it's definitely no. Do you muster out? Do you get advanced? Do you become a merchant? Did you get your own ship? And did you die in character generation? So no, there's none of that. Next, uh, we get into those character classes I just mentioned. There are 25 of these. Like, that's that's a huge number of character classes for a rules light system. Uh, way more than was origi- in, in the original rule book. Uh, these are broken into standard classes that are expected to be used in any campaign. So if you're running White Star, you have these classes. And then there are optional classes that can be added to specific campaigns to emulate specific sci-fi genres and character types in them. These optional classes are actually further split to include the mystic classes. Um, These are the ones that can use magic. Um, Magic in this is not magic. It's in the form of gifts, meditations, and something interesting called chitterlings, which we'll get to later. Now, each class is presented with a one or two plate spread with an XP chart that shows the hit dice at each level. Um, And again, hit dice, like the game it's based on, going back to the start, everything rolls D6. Hit dice are D6. And you may not get a full hit dice every level. So if you're like a mystic, you might get D6. And at level two, you have D6 plus one. Well, you don't get to roll another D6. You just have one more hit point. And at level three, you might have D6 plus two. But then when you hit level four, you might have two D6. And then two D6 plus one and so on. Um, You have a BHB, which is a base hit bonus number. This is a number added to all attacks. Um, This system came out, the system this is based on came out before Thaco. So you don't have a Thaco that goes down. Instead, you have a bonus to all attack rolls based on your level. And then you have a saving throw. Now you just have one. It's you have a saving throw and it's a number. It's based on your class. You don't get any of this more modern reflex saves, will saves, con saves, just one generic catch all saving throw. Now, along with this, there are a number of special abilities for each class, some of which you get at the start, and others you unlock as you go up levels, a very D20 RPG-based system. Old school indeed. Now, the basic classes include Aristocrat, with abilities like Powerful Speaker and Silver Tongue, who build a retinue as they advance in levels. The Mercenary, who's a weapons specialist and can even form their own mercenary company at high levels. Another old school throwback there. Uh, pilots with skills like Space Ace and Jury Rig. Robot, which in another old school callback can only go to level four, but have a number of abilities like scanners and the fact they can be repaired instead of healed. Um, there are four different types of robots you can choose from combat robots, diplomacy robots, mechanical robots, and medical robots. And then we have star knights who have their star swords and follow the way and can learn powerful meditations. And I'm pretty sure everyone knows what that's based on. Now, the optional classes include alien brutes. Um, Interestingly, this isn't just uh, the one you think of, at least the one I think of on the top of my head. This includes your falcon men, a race called the Procreon, the Quinian, and the Rarer, which is the one I was thinking of. And a nice call out to Marvel, there are space ducks and wolflings. There is a bounter hunter, uh, which of course they had to include for certain fans, uh, that can do subduing attacks. Brinlings, which I actually like that name, which are basically sci-fi halflings with uncanny luck. Combat medics who get the most out of med packs and can even bring someone back from the brink at higher levels. Ciphers for those who want some cyberpunk hacking in their sci-fi. Deep space explorers who are great at surviving on four worlds and good at xenobiology. Freed a simulant, Hugh or seven of nine, anyone? Gunslingers for that old West style sci-fi that you can't take from me. 
The Man of Tomorrow, going back to those sci-fi serials and things like The Rocket Man. The Mecha Jock, uh, something totally new to this edition, which brings you to the whole Battletech, Robotech, Pacific Rim. Uh, White Star can now do them all. The Nova Machina, which even will let you do Transformers. You got the plucky sidekick who has one of the coolest abilities in the game, in my opinion. One of the things is the plucky sidekick can use I believe in you and buffs the rest of the party. There's the rock star because, well, no game is complete without a rocker boy. Come on, that's the best class ever. The two fisted technician with the aptly named bang it on a hammer, bang on it with a hammer ability. And the yab nabs, obviously inspired by furry bear like creatures from a certain forest moon. Well, there are certainly some fun classes there, and it's amusing how they really don't try and file down the serial numbers too much on no. what they're borrowing from. No, it is it is pretty dang obvious what all of those classes are based on. Uh, finally, we have the optional mystic classes. These include alien mystics. Uh, they use spells like gifts and come from the same types as the alien brutes that I mentioned before in the last section. But this is for your, your Yodas, your guardian, your sage, your, your guiding character. There are the star pilots because, you know, some of those people who follow the way are excellent pilots. Spinning's a nice trick. Then there are the star squirrels. Uh, this one is a bit of an inside joke. So James, the designer of the game, has a thing for squirrels. And way back in the G Plus days, a bunch of them encur us encouraged him to put a squirrel race into his game. And that was not in the original book. He decided to include the star squirrel in the Galaxy Edition. Um, their weapons and armor are made of natural materials, but somehow still produce science-like effects like lasers. And they have small star swords and acorn ships. They have a special version of the way, and they use chitterlings, a special type of medication. Um, there are even star squirrels that have turned to the void, the so-called black tail star squirrels. They're the perfect unexpected enemy for your white star campaign. And then finally, you have the untrained initiate. This is your um, user of meditations that doesn't understand how they work that you find on the fringes who wasn't taken in by the uh void knights or whatever when they were kids yeah very cool though i'm not sure i like the idea of pilots meditating mid-flight that sounds problematic yeah it's you know it's supposed to be the the eight eight i'm sure they are referencing a couple specific pilots oh, I, yeah, I from mean. a couple specific series <laughs> Uh, the last thing you're going to find in the character creation system is totally optional, 100% optional, because the original game this was based on didn't touch this stuff at all because no one even thought of it, is a really basic skill system. Uh, there are a number of skills listed that can be ranked one to five that are affected by those ability bonuses, which again, only go plus one to plus two, right? Or minus two to plus two. Using a skill in this game is dead simple. You roll a D6, and if you roll the skill rating or lower, so if you have a two on a one and two on a D6, your skill worked, right? That's it. Dead simple. Super light, but it's nice to see, because like I said, the original like proficiencies hadn't been invented when White Box came out. If you're going to go old school, why bother with skills? <laughs> you could play without them. Totally optional. Um, next up, we have equipment. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. This is your usual list of gear, melee weapons, missile weapons, armor, and shields. Interestingly, again, going back to the original system, all weapon damage is D6. Not that they all do D6 damage. It might be D6 plus two, or it might be two D6, but you don't need any D8s and D12s. There's no broad swords that do D8 and long swords that do whatever. And actually, I hadn't mentioned it before. All you need to play this game is a D20 and some D6s. It's the only funky dice it uses. Now, again, this is something that goes back to white box is descending armor class. The hit system here, as I mentioned earlier, predates Thacko. Lower armor class is better, and to see if you hit, you actually have to reference a two-hit chart. Yes, you may eventually memorize it, and yes, you can kind of figure out the math, but it's more complicated than Thacko. You're probably going to have to use the chart. Now, thankfully, James gave in to peer pressure and also included an optional system for ascending armor class for those of us ready to move into the next millennium and make it so that you always want to roll high. You can take my charts from my cold dead hands. <laughs> Uh, chapter four is a 
big mishmash of rules and no discernible order, uh, at least no order I'd noticed. Um, this is just like all the stuff that can come up during play that wasn't covered yet. So it's like, I don't know. It was kind of weird. So there's time. Uh, again, you're going old school, like original here. One minute round, 10 minute turns. Besides the fact, I think those are backwards. Turns and rounds go the other way around. Those are long. Like I always found that odd. Like one minute's a long time. Like trying to play that you're doing one minute turns, you got to describe a lot more than I walk up and open the door. Like that doesn't take ten a, a minute. And rounds are 10 minutes. So you're like each combat round, like, oh, spells last 10 minutes long. Uh, it's just weird. I personally, if I ran this system, well, I have run this system. I just default to the basic, you know, two, three seconds per action with maybe a round, everyone going being a minute, but whatever. I, I feel like those times were based on like throwaway comments. It's like, hey, Gary, how do we set up turns? Oh, just break them up into minutes. Everyone understands that. And then they moved on. I don't yeah. think there was really any significant thought put into that. I there was definitely a lot of arguments over the years about how important those times are. Uh, according to Gary Gygash, you cannot have a meaningful campaign without accurately tracking time. That, that is a quote from the master himself. So I don't know. I, I, I just the number of arguments over no, an attack roll is a series of blows, and no, each roll is a swing. I just play it your own way. It's a DIY game. No one's going to show up at your house and say, your turns aren't long enough. Now, as mentioned earlier, saving throws in White Star are based on one number, and it's class-based. Uh, these are for avoiding uh, everything. Uh, manipulation, area effects, meditations, collapsing corridors, uh, the inevitable bridge fire that starts as soon as your ship takes one point of damage. All of those, you're going to roll a save to see if you're affected by it or not. Uh, movement rules are based on feats and meant to be abstract, uh, though they they give a very basic system for using grids. Um, by very basic, I think it just says it's 10 feet to a hex or 10 feet to a square, and that's it. They don't talk about line of sight or anything like that. Uh, encumbrance rules are present, but fully optional. Another trope of old school gaming is the ability of players to hire hirelings. Uh, this was actually the norm back in the day where most adventuring groups would consist of a large number of non-player characters that would be traveling around with your your player characters something you just don't see anymore like i D, &D parties now like maybe someone's got an animal companion or something but that's about it now here they don't call them hirelings they call them assistants and you can hire all kinds of different types from engineers and soldiers to translators and animal trainers just in case you need someone to look after that rancor now, there is some other stuff here, like environmental effects, surprise, stealth. This is just basically the bash all chapter of rule stuff that didn't fit anywhere else. Ignoring encumbrance thanks to NPC slavery. Yep, we have moved on from those days. Yes, we have. Again, optional, which is always nice. So up next is personal combat. Um, this is D20 based. Uh, there are two systems here, one that uses descending armor class and a two hit chart and another that uses ascending armor class uh all damage is d6 base uh initiatives by side which is another old school concept the players as a group or the gm one goes first before the other initiative dead simple roll d6 whoever rolls higher goes first if you tie you go simultaneously um and all that does is it that everyone doesn't take damage till the end of the round so if you die you still got your action or if the monster dies um other than that it's typical d20 combat like uh, there, there's some interesting callback optional rules for those who want an old school feel, like uh, the rule that you have to declare your actions before initiatives roll and then still have to go out along with them, even after the opponents have gone and possibly ruined what you said. That's definitely another old school callback. Well, you like programmed action games, so declaring actions before <laughs> initiative is just like that. Uh, to be honest, that's one of the things I've almost thought of trying again. I, like now and then I miss that because you never get the like spell you were about to cast that gets interrupted. You can't really do that with most of the modern systems. And that was always a, a, such a trope of older D&D. &D. Uh, and narrative, narrative games work, uh, work that way because you, you declare your action role. And if you don't hit, then chances are good. Something has come along to interrupt that action. That yeah, you that's true. It's a, it's a different way to do it. Yeah. Uh, the next chapter is full of rules for starship combat. This is very abstract. Um, things like speed aren't used to like move on a map or anything, or even 
just to figure out how many miles you went or light years or whatever. It's literally just to compare relative speed between two ships. One's got a 50, one's got a 44. Well, the 50 can outrun the 44, basically. Um, overall, it's pretty close to the rules for personal combat with some additional rules, like the whole you're on a ship, so different people can take on different roles, like firing of weapons, controlling the shields. Um, there are full shield rules, and shields come back, and you can change where they're facing. You know, stuff you'd expect from a sci-fi game. Now, one part I did like are some random charts for what's going wrong on the ship each time it's hit. Uh, I, I dig that. That's your whole, especially Star Trek feel, right? The, as the ship hits, the lights flicker and fires start on the bridge and electricity starts going out. And to me, that's interesting. You even see this in Star Wars, right? They got to go fix the whatever Chewie's got to go down the port and the Millennium Falcon and fix something. I thought that was really cool. Um, there's also rules for buying and building ships with tons of examples, lots of different ships. An often underused or overlooked aspect of sci-fi RPGs and it's a welcome addition to include that, you know, you're not just fighting on ground, you're you're fighting in the air and fighting in, the, in space. Yep. Now, after Starships, we get something new for the Galaxy Edition, which is a full set of rules for vehicles and vehicular combat. Uh, this includes ground vehicles and atmospheric flight. Um, in the original game, vehicles were meant to be a story tool, right? Like you showed up in a Jeep or you're doing this. It was just now you can actually play out some Mad Max style combats or dogfights in the air. This chapter is very similar to the Starship combat system with some rule differences, like uh, rules for ramming, which they assumed with Starship combat that the space is big enough, that's not an issue. Um, targeting characters that are on vehicles and stuff like that. It's still very abstract. And again, you got a ton of example vehicles, including, of course, the Yabnab glider. Depending on the style of game you're running, this could be a really valuable tool. Next up, we got mecha combat. Again, same deal, right? Uh, some slight rules tweaks for mechas with rules for combining mechs with vehicles and personal combat and even rules for transforming mecha and, of course, a bunch of example mecha. Uh, like vehicle combat, these weren't in the original. So this is a whole new set of rules for throwing in battle tech or whatever anime series you prefer doing the Gundam thing or whatever. Uh, again, it all depends on the, the style you're looking to reproduce. But can you do Voltron? There are no rules for combiners in the base set, though I wouldn't be surprised if some fan has put rules out there. There are transforming, but you're still in a cockpit. So you, the transforming went with, I got to admit, is um, less Transformers and more Robotech Macross Saga mm. is what we're going for. Now, once we get done with all these combat systems, which is a huge chunk of the book, to be honest, we get to mysticism, which is the magic of White Star. I like the game it's based on. There are a few different types of mysticism with abilities broken out by level. Um, some are going to require intelligence. Some are going to require wisdom. A character can use mysticism advanced. They're going to get slots. They fill with specific mystic abilities. And these slots are spent once the ability is used, right? This is your fancy and magic system that's been around since original D&D. &D. And it fits that it's in here because it's based on original D&D. &D. Um, the number of the classes, though, do have a more modern mechanic where they can spend their slots to do other things, which is actually, to me, a nice an, a nice addition to the game. So you're not locked into, I memorized the wrong thing, and it's useless for this whole campaign. Now, star knights, star pilots, and untrained initiates use what they call meditations, which they get from following the way. Star squirrels get the chitterlings, and alien mystics have gifts. Now, there are a significant number of these, but not as many as you would see in a standard F20 game, right? And it's like in a D&D or other fantasy game. For example, there are only 28 meditations split over four levels, and even less chitterlings and gifts. That's not really a lot. Now, these run the gamut, um, stuff you've seen spells do for years, like Charm Person, Increased Acrobatics, Healing, Detecting Life, Reading Languages, Manipulate Objects, Danger Sense, Telekinesis, etc. Now, what I did think is interesting is there aren't really any attack spells, right? You don't have any lightning bolts, magic missiles, fireballs. Um, I do think the Void Knight does have an ability to cast lightning, but it's not actually a meditation. Yeah, and frankly, I find this refreshing. Fireball is a trope now, and frankly, yeah. poor use of abilities when lasers and magic swords already exist to attack with. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I was impressed by the exclusion of those attack spells. 
Uh, chapter 10, Alien and Creatures. This is giving you stats for both NPCs the players may encounter, both in the form of allies and enemies, and a number of creatures, which are mostly meant to be adversaries, but there are a couple potential allies in there. This is your monster section, right? Your monster manual from any other D20 thing with stats, a description, and special rules for each. Now, it's not a very long chapter. What the book strongly suggests is finding other adversaries from other white box products to build on what's here. Uh, there are also a set of suggestions for making your own aliens and creatures. And there is so much free box content out there. All you got to do is look for it and you can find all manner of interesting creatures that can easily be adapted to sci-fi. Now, what you will find here are monsters based on well-known sci-fi licenses like the Canics, which look like upside down hovering garbage cans with appendages sticking out that like to say obliterate in a tinny voice and the assimilants who it might be futile to resist. They really didn't spend much time filing off the cereals. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I, I don't know if uh, Disney would have a problem with this book nowadays. Um, so far, he's gotten away with it. But yeah, uh, it, it, it is blatantly obvious. From Actually, to be honest, a fun game to play with your friends is the what monster, what, what sci-fi license is this monster based on? That, that is a, a, a White Star metagame you can play with your friends while, you know, waiting for the other players to show up. Uh, chapter 11 presents a whole bunch of new rules for White Star. Uh, these are new with the, the Galaxy Edition. So what's here is cybernetics, etchings, and advanced equipment. So cybernetic rules are pretty simple. Buy really expensive replacement parts and get some kind of bonus for it. Now, there are optional rules for limiting the amount you can buy, but nothing as detailed as like the humanity-based systems of Shadowrun or Cyberpunk. Advanced technology is basically what I would think of as the magic system in a fantasy RPG. It includes things like powered armor, personal shields, and star sword gems, which uh, I, they didn't use the word spell kyber weird, at least. Um, you'll also find a couple of relics. These are basically your artifacts. Um, one amused the heck out of me because it's obviously based on uh, the Masters of the Universe. It is a pair of swords called the Edges of Singularity, one created from Star and the other created from Void. And when you bring the two together, magic things happen. And then the Key to the Cosmos, which was obviously inspired by the Nelvana cult classic, Rock and Rule, one of my favorite animated cyberpunk movies. Now, etchings are a form of tattoo magic that are only used by the Yab Nabs and the Star Squirrels, which is cool enough, though I don't quite know why this needed a separate chapter. I think because it was new content. I This should have just been in with the description of Nab, Yab Nabs and Star Squirrels to me. Yeah, have they made the mistake of cyberpunk and added negatives to the cyber enhancements? No, none yeah, at all. There excellent. is absolutely no disadvantage, to, except for the cost, of of buying cyberware now there is an optional rule that limits it but it's literally a a your con bonus plus something like five plus your con bonus or something like that so yes yeah, someone with weak constitution can't have as much but it, it's not really a negative for having the cyberware right now the next chapter uh is the white star campaign which presents a number of possible settings for the game and again, uh, as we've mentioned multiple times here, these are pretty obviously based on popular sci-fi licenses. Now, each of these has a suggestion for which classes are most appropriate to use for which setting and the tone that you're expected to play in that setting. These include rebels against the regime, explorers among the stars, invasion, brothers in arms, just keep flying, a thousand thousand worlds, and White Star and Swords and Wizardry, which is a small section suggesting on how best to combine White Star with the fantasy game, mainly leading to your adventure style of like the original Barrier Peaks, where you have the fantasy game and you find a starship, or you have your starship find a fantasy world, going either way. Uh, so uh, nothing unexpected there, I think. That's all pretty, pretty much what you'd hope yep. for. Now, there is, in a very odd spot in the book, right after this, a very modern house rule included here, which I'm, I don't know why it's in this section, but it's called the Deeds Dark and Daring system, which adds a pool of daring deed points that is calculated at the start of each game. And these can be used by players to do things like automatically succeed at a roll or prevent dying. Uh, so they, they, your character comes and goes down to one hit point further. Have an ally turn out in a timely fashion. Or even be able to add something narratively to the game. 
Now, this is a basic version of systems we've seen in modern games like Fate Points or Bennies and Savage Worlds, though there's no economy here. There's no buying and spending and earning, and there's no way for the DM to give out more or spend them on their own. This is a pretty basic in-game economy, but I would, uh, to me, a real welcome addition to what's really a really old-style game. Interesting, uh, but don't have really long sections or make sure you pace out your deeds appropriately so you don't run out. <laughs> very fair, very fair. Yeah, if you want to metagame it, oh, we're out of points. I got to go home. Oh, sorry, I'm tired. The kids are getting <laughs> up in the morning. Now, these setting suggestions are followed by a chapter of random tables. Always like to see these stuff. Uh, these can be used to randomly generate all kinds of things um, or just use them for inspiration, right? A GM can just read off on them and decide to use stuff. You got creating star systems, planetary planets, what atmosphere a planet has, the primary terrain type, the native species, uh, technology level. There's a bunch of random charts for determining a surface encounter. And there's a bunch of charts for doing a space encounter. And no, these aren't all just like waves of monsters. It's like you've found a singularity or something. Now we get to the final chapter. I realize it's been a bit long, but I really wanted to showcase what you do get in this book. And the last chapter is called The Interstellar Upheaval. This is a complete campaign setting for White Star. This is very obviously Star Wars inspired with an evil empire, Star Knights versus evil Void Knights. The Void Knights are under control of the mysterious Supreme Lord. And I think that was before the Supreme Lord Snoke even existed. So maybe maybe someone got inspired by White Star when they came up with that character. Uh, four different sectors of space are detailed, giving you a hex map, which, man, does it remind me of Traveler, um, and descriptions of everything that's on these maps, including, you know, asteroid fields and bases and stuff like that. What I thought was odd is there's no adventure. And that's mainly odd to me because there is one in the much smaller original book to give you an idea of how to play this game. Personally, I, I think this is a miss. I, I think every role-playing game should include a sample adventure because that is the designer of the game telling me how to play their game, telling me the kind of situations that should come up, what you should call for roles for, and what the characters can expect from the system. So I would have liked to have seen something in there. Sadly, you're not going to find this in the this Galaxy edition of White Star. And I'm, I'm really of two minds about that, honestly. While in some systems that may lend themselves to a very specific style of play, I think mm -hmm. that can be helpful, while in others, it can be limiting when the system is robust enough that one adventure really isn't enough to show off what a system can do and may pigeonhole the game uh, for many GMs. See, that's, uh, that's fair, but then include three starter adventures. They don't even have to be long. Give me a one-page one sheet. So, like, Savage Worlds is famous for this. I can't remember what they're called, but they're one-page adventures. And they put out a ton, because again, it's a generic system, and to show aspects of the system, they put out different one-page adventures. They have, um, you know, here's the setup, here's the type of characters you have, here's the perks that you should allow, here's a little short encounter, whether it's like a shootout at the OK Corral or whatever. Um, I think that's really cool, but there's none of that in here. Like, I, I include three. Like, I don't know, maybe there isn't a link in the book. Uh, give me a link to a free PDF of sample adventures. I just feel like it's something that every RPG should have. Uh, is there any random adventure creation systems at all? No, not that. Well, like I said, there's a, there's a random encounter and a random space encounter system. So I guess you could kind of use it as a sandbox. Uh, you could probably do, do some kind of like West Marches thing where you just take one of these star maps and every time you move to a new hex, you roll up on the table. But it's not really formalized. It's not written as an adventure system. All it's telling you is things like you encounter a Nova and here's a bit of mechanics and like they're, they're mechanics down to like one roll, not an adventure. It's like you encounter a Nova, you're going to have to make a shaving throw for your ship. Your shields aren't going to work. This is a perfect time for the DM to throw in a monster or something, right? Like that's about it so that that is something i personally missed yep. now before i get into my personal thoughts of white star galaxy edition and how it actually plays at the table i want to highlight exactly what's new in this edition of game versus this one which i reviewed back in 2018 which you can find on the tabletop hell Hub blog if you want to read my reviews in general all the rules from the original edition is in here as well as a another supplement that was published both in print and PDF called the White Star Companion. And all of the class supplements that were released, and there were a number of them, were included. 
Now, the one thing that James did cut out are the multi-class rules. Those have been dropped entirely. So you can no longer multi-class in this version of White Star. Now, in addition to these old rules gathered in one place, there are a half dozen new classes. Uh, the Mech Jock, the Rock Star, the Star Squirrels, and three other ones are all brand new. And as noted earlier, the rules for vehicles and mecha combat are completely new. And with those, there are a lot more example ships. So like the Starship section, the rules of this, there are a lot more examples of different types. Uh, the advanced tech system is completely new. A uh, number of the aliens are all new. I remember in the original rules, the um, alien brute was literally just your rower. Uh, that's it. That's the only one. So they spread that out to include like the, the Hawkman from um, Flash Gordon. Um, so there are a number of new aliens. A uh, number of new meditations were adding, added. So you have more spells. Uh, the etchings are completely new. The setting material was greatly expanded. Uh, which is, in my opinion, at the cost of the adventure. So they cut out the adventure and they gave me more sectors. And I'm like, ah, I figure I could come up with my own sectors easier than I can come up with a sample adventure, but whatever. That's a choice. Um, now, actual rule changes are very, very minimal. Um, the only real big impact one is in the original rules. The stat modifiers were either plus one or minus one or zero. So they actually expanded the curve, making it minus two to plus two. Uh, but what there are a ton more of our house rules and optional rules that were thrown in, but core mechanics, no real changes. So in summary, what you have here is a combination of the original core book, the original, all of the official barrel rider supplements, everything that James Spawn's company put out, as well as over a hundred pages of new material. All right. Well, what is it you thought of this white star galaxy edition? All right. First off, this is a really solid little book. Like it looks great. Um, even despite the fact it's black and white, I, I still dig it. Part of that to me is the old school charm, right? Like it's got that old school look because of it. I didn't even mind that it's in black and white. Um, the rules are easy to read, clear and concise, clear and very concise when they need to be. Actual mechanics, uh, they're tied and true. Uh, they match what this game's trying to do, right? Which is to emulate the feel of some of the first role-playing games ever published, which had a focus on rulings over rules and that whole DIY mentality. Like, take this book and do what you want with it. This is a set of guidelines. Modify it and make it your own. And that is exactly what it did. What I personally appreciated was the modern touches that were thrown in here and there to make the game more current and more appealing to modern gamers. Things like ascending armor class instead of looking stuff up on charts, alignments being completely optional, toss them out, and even a point-based uh, plot point system, right? A, a resource the players can spend to affect the story. That is a, definitely something you didn't see in any of Gygax's old games. Yeah, there are days when I wish rulings over rules was still more prevalent than it really is uh unfortunately the the bad idea of gm as antagonist has often meant that in so many systems players are untrusting of their gm yeah. and and not willing to accept their rulings just blankly yeah that is the, that is the potential disadvantage of ruling over rules is that can be be abused by the gm now i will admit White Star, nowhere in there do they push that whole adversarial GM idea. There's never presented as a you versus them, you must challenge the players. None of that's in here, which is a good sign. But it's definitely, it can be abused. There's That is the one thing where with modern role-playing games, you can very often, the DM says, this happens. You can be like, no, look, I'm page this. You know, you're not going to get that in this style of game. So yeah, I agree. That can be a problem. Okay. Now I have actually run White Star in it went so-so uh the main problem we had was getting everyone at the table into that old school mentality um it's uh, one of the big ones is the whole hireling thing right the whole assistance thing modern players just don't think to hire outside help to accomplish things in a role-playing game nowadays it's just not part of modern role-playing uh maybe a couple have them but like the fact that like your crew of your ship you have to go hire an engineer if one of your players isn't. And even if you're going exploring a new planet, you want to have a translator with you. And no, it shouldn't be that every player has, or someone in the group has translator. No, just hire someone with translator. It's, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift backwards in a way. 
Um, the other thing that shocked my players was the lethality. Um, that is something that's definitely changed in role-playing games over time uh, with most traditional role-playing games. Like Dungeons and Dragons used to be highly deadly, and now it's almost at a super heroic level where it's kind of hard to kill a character off without kind of overkilling it, right? And killing off characters isn't encouraged either, right? Whereas part of the, the thing with White Star is that's part of why making a character so easy. So that you're going to die and you're going to be able to roll up a new character and start playing the same night because it's nice and simple. You roll 3d6 in order, do a little bit of shopping, write down your powers and go. Um, the other thing too is the lethality in the saving throw. So there's only the one saving throw, right? Well, save versus death is a thing in White Star. So moments like falling rocks, void knights, choke attack, explosive decompression, or getting hit by a particle beam pistol, you're one D20 away from death. You make your save or you fail. Unless you're using that optional plot point system, which is why I encourage it, because then you'd be like, wait, that's not fun. I don't, that doesn't happen. I don't, I managed to grab the wall before I get ripped out of the ship or that particle beam pistol happens to hit the piece of vibranium in my pocket and it vaporizes that, but not me or whatever. This style of play is not going to be for everyone. And at my table, when I ran this game, it was about a 50-50 split. There, there were players who were right into it, who remember the old days and loved the feel of it and loved how willy-nilly it was. And as a DM, I liked some ass. The, the fact you used a D6 for everything. Like you go up to a panel on a one or two, a D6, you get it to work. Like that's it. That's the kind of rulings that are made. Everything's D6 based. Does the bad guy notice you on a one, two or three on a D6, they notice you like that. That's as complicated as it had to get. And I had a lot of fun with just using that simple D6 to do things. The hard part was coming up with those while well, I didn't roll a one, two, three on a D6. So what happens, which I uh, had to stretch my improv skills a bit. I, I liked it, but I will admit not all of my players liked it. Yeah, I can see it as a, a fun outing into the past, but I would struggle to make this a weekly game long term. But there's a reason we've moved past many of these things. Yeah, I agree. Plus, there's also the fact that it's meant to be a toolbox, right? So you can modify it for your group. But you get to a point where you've used that toolbox and modified it so much it's no longer white star it's another thing and once you get to that point you're probably better off moving to another system that better suits your taste yeah which leads me to my next issue with white star uh it's the fact that this is meant to be a generic sci-fi system that covers all types of sci-fi well this is cool it's great to have a generic sci-fi rpg and I appreciate the attempt to cover that broad range of sci-fi, but it also means that it's not particularly good at showing off any one type of game. Like, well, sure, you can play Star Wars with Star Knights and the Way and the Void Knights and your Star Sabers, but it's not the same as playing a Star Wars role-playing game with rules for dark side and light side points and the ability to call on the force to improve your skills. Similarly, I don't think you can really capture a feel of Star Trek without some kind of detailed skill system and non-combat force focused character abilities. Like, well, you got a couple class like pilot and a two-fisted technician. There's no science officers or like, there's no way to play a botanist in this. Like, yeah, you can play a different character who's a combat guy who happens to have botanists. You're definitely not going to find a ship's counselor. And what's an alien game without detailed rules for stealth and radar blips and a panic system? Yeah, it's really sort of a nod at everything, which if you're not a super fan, might yeah. be enough. But it just won't touch the needs of those who are deeply mm -hmm. in tune with those various settings that the serial numbers have been vaguely filed off. Vaguely. I, <laughs> I, I suspect that the intent for this game and, and the, the key demographic is the fantasy D&D &D lovers who just want to try something else but stick with a system they're familiar with. Yeah, that's possible. That's definitely possible. And yes, right? We've said it before. You can play around with it. You can hack it. You can make it work for Star Trek. But I just think if you really want to play an RPG in an established sci-fi universe, you're probably better off picking a game meant to emulate that universe. Now, that said, it does have the advantage over those systems of, the, of that super rules light. The, the like I said, D6 for everything, very quick to implement and use at the table. So there is something to be said for a rules light system and ruling over rules. That you like uh, look at fantasy flight game Star Wars compared to the size of this book. Like that is a detailed, crunchy system with a really cool narrative dice pool. But that's definitely harder to learn than White Star. 
And then there's also the advantage of only have to learn one system by the players, right? So we're playing cyberpunk this week using white star. And now next week we're going to play star Wars. You don't have to learn anything new. You're using the same system. So swapping genres doesn't mean having to learn a whole new game. Whereas if I stay, start playing fantasy flight star Wars, and then I decide to play, um, I can't remember who makes the new Star Trek, Star Trek Adventures. I know it's called Modiphius, maybe. But you start playing Star Trek Adventures, you got to learn a whole new system from beginning to end with different stats and a different combat mechanic and everything. You got to learn new. Whereas you could swap overnight. Like you just, all right, we're making characters for this setting. You can even bring your characters from Star Wars to Star Trek. So there are advantages to it. Yeah. And if you're already an OSR fantasy lover, it's even easier to take that side trip down into sci fi. Totally agree. Now, overall, uh, there were some negatives there, but I'm, I'm impressed by this. This is a very solid OSR style rule set that's rules light, simple to learn. While it does stick to many of the old school tropes, there are a number of modern optional house rules tossed in there to keep the game relevant for more modern gamers. Character creation is nice and quick. Gameplay flows well. Uh, the fact that it only needs a D20 and a D6 can be a bonus. Though I think most gamers nowadays have a set of polyhedrals, but maybe not. I, I think it does a good job of being able to facilitate nearly any type of sci-fi role-playing. But I do think it suffers a bit for not having enough genre-specific rules. But being a role-playing toolbox, you're encouraged to make up those rules on your own. So it, it does what it's set out to do. Yeah, and then I think the original creation is where I hope the game would really shine. Mis mixing those different worlds in an almost Dream Park version of sci-fi play. Yeah, I can totally see that. And to be honest, that's a huge part of the OSR, right? Is the DIY nature of the game and doing new things and mashing new things. And to be honest, there are a lot of third-party people who have put out specific settings for White Star, so you can get that granularity required to really do some genre play. Now, as for comparing Galaxy Edition to the original, just forget the original, forget it exists. There's, there's no reason for this piece of paper in my hand here to exist, just pick this up. This is, it, it completely replaces the old edition. While still being compatible technically with everything that's in here and everything released for it, which is important because there is a lot of fan created content for the original White Star. Still works together. What you're getting here is a number of older books put into one package with over 100 pages of new content. If you're getting into White Star, this is it. Just pick up White Star, White Box, Science Fiction Role Playing Galaxy Edition. Now, as for whether you should even check this game out, should you care about White Star? That depends what you're looking for in a game. If you dig the older style role-playing games, if you dig the feel of original D&D or Star Frontiers, and you want to go back to that feeling, you want to recreate it with some slightly modernized versions of those mechanics, then yeah, check out White Star. It'll probably be perfect for you. If you're looking to create a very specific sci-fi license or genre, well, White Star will probably work, you're probably better off finding a game that's about that specific setting. It's probably going to do a better job evoking the feel of whatever world that is. Now, if you want a versatile sci-fi RPG where you can switch genres or mash them together and works for all kinds of different sci-fi settings, this might be exactly what you need. For a more detailed look at White Star, White Box, Science Fiction, Role-Playing, Galaxy Edition, <laughs> Be sure to check out our written review over at tabletopbellhop.com.